Hello, everyone. Welcome to Chestnut Retreat Center's second online seminar in our seminar series. Uh, our first seminar was about leading our children through the pandemic. Uh, you can watch the highlights of that uh, seminar on our YouTube channel. Today, we will be talking about the problem of evil and suffering in COVID days. So I'm going to continue introducing our uh, speaker today, Dr. Hakan Gök. Dr. Hakan Gök is a research fellow at the Center for Governance, Leadership, and Global Responsibility at Leeds Beckett University. He obtained his master's and PhD in the UK. He studied atheism and theism, focusing on the philosophy of Said Nursi, earning his PhD degree from Durham University. Dr. Gök's research interests are the problem of evil and suffering, arguments for and against the existence of God, atheist philosophy, Life and Discourse of Ghazali, Rumi, and Sirhindi. He is the author of Atheism or Theism, The Perspective of Said Nursi, editor of Selected Readings from the Risali Nur, Essential Rumi Stories, and co-editor of India, Turkey, History, Culture, and Politics. Dr. Gök is also one of the editors of the Journal of Research in Social Sciences and Language. Now I would like to hand it off to Dr. Gök, uh, for his presentation. We will be taking questions at the end. You can write your questions in the chat box and I will ask them, or you may also ask them in person if you would like after the presentation. Dr. Gek. Hi, everybody. Right, greetings from lovely England. It is 8 p.m. Probably it's early afternoon where you are. Uh, thanks for having me. I hope uh, you'll all enjoy this brief session and uh, I hope it's gonna be beneficial for all. I have noticed uh, in the biography, we have missed a crucial part. Uh, I am a physicist. I'm sure you're all surprised. I spent my early career teaching physics uh, in schools. Uh, then I switched to uh, philosophy because I came to a point that I should use all my uh, scientific knowledge and apply into different fields. That's why I shifted into uh, philosophy, which is quite useful because most philosophers, they are something in life first, then they do philosophy on top. So uh, it's a spoiler. If you hear a lot of uh, scientific talk, uh, you should forgive me because uh, I'm a scientist, I'm a physicist, and you can feel it uh, in my talks. Uh, after teaching physics so many years, I uh, focused on uh, theology, philosophy of religion, and I looked into uh, God question, and I studied uh, atheism, theism, and uh, in particular, I looked at uh, Nursi's writings. It was quite enjoyable. Uh, I think in life, you should do something you really enjoy doing, otherwise it is just, just a burden. Uh, as mentioned in the uh, biography, yes, uh, problem of evil is one of my uh, hot topics. I personally like it to study and learn more about and uh, share my insight. So I'm not going to be prescribing uh, what to do uh, if uh, calamities and tribulations hit you, but I'm just going to share uh, what I have found out uh, during my research. <clears throat> so next uh, 40 odd minutes, uh, it's going to be rather like a monologue. I'll just uh, deliver a lecture in a casual form, don't panic. I'll uh, show some slides and uh, talk over them. The topic is uh, very flexible, very open-ended and open to debate. Uh, it certainly takes more than uh, 40 minutes, but I'll try to give a social and uh, philosophical perspective to it. Uh, in terms of timing, I can't think of any better time than this because we've been hit globally by evil. Because when I uh, delivered this problem of evil lecture on uh, some random occasions, people think, look, this is a beautiful day. We are enjoying our lives. So what is this about, all about? But now everybody is interested in problem of evil. And what does it mean? How should we react to it? Is it bad? So. I'm going to present my findings and uh, my insights in the coming minutes. <clears throat> Don't worry, this problem of evil 
And suffering, we call it theodicy in philosophy. It's a fancy word. Theodicy is nothing new. Don't think I suddenly came up with, oh, the problem of evil and suffering. It's been there for, for millennia. Uh, we are going to start off with the hero. We're going to go to ancient Greece, and we're going to see how it first appeared. Right. <clears throat> This is our hero, Epicurus. If you have done, if you have done a bit of philosophy, probably uh, you have heard of the man. He died 270 before Christ. So this is the year 2020. You add 270 to it. So it is 1,490 years. Quite a long time. And this is still the very foundation of problem of evil. So Epicurus came up with a paradox, which is still valid today. He says, is God willing to prevent evil, but not, not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Another fancy word in plain English, it, is, it means all powerful. Is he able, but not willing? Then he is malevolent, wicked. Because we describe God as omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, omniscient, and benevolent. So this is the definition of God, at least in Abrahamic religions. So Epicurus says, well, if he is incapable of preventing evil, he is not omnipotent. If he can, but if he doesn't do it deliberately, he must be malevolent, not benevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? Very popular paradox. The, this is what it implies. It implies that if there is God, there shouldn't be evil and suffering. There is evil and suffering. Earthquakes, hunger, flood, now COVID. I think it's one of the most felt evil in recent history. You know, we've been under lockdown for 10 years months and in Britain we have more than thousand people losing their lives every day and we, we still don't know what to do because it is mutating into different forms and we find a vaccination it is not uh, with you know low efficacy then we have another virus we still don't see the light at the end of the tunnel so I think it is it's a high time everybody feels uh, the suffering the evil. Now they say, well, why is God letting this happen? Why is he not uh, preventing this? And they, they ask this question, if evil is happening, maybe there is no God. But we argue that <clears throat> evil is necessary and evil does not mean that there is no benevolent an omnipotent God. So we're going to look at what evil means to, you know, uh, individuals like us. What should we understand when uh, evil and calamities uh, strike us? This might mean several things, and it might uh, bring us certain benefits. When I say benefits, everybody might be thinking of material benefits, uh, but it is true. You know, evil brings not only spiritual benefits, but also brings uh, material benefits. Yes, a lot of people suffer. Yes, people lose their lives. But in terms of uh, humanity's uh, progression, it overall brings benefits. Take, for example, the Great Plague 
I mean, it wiped out, you know, great chunk of uh, population in, in London. Yes, people suffered, people lost their lives, but it was one of the turning points in, uh, in our history. Then we introduced uh, certain hygiene standards. We improved our infrastructure. People have suffered, but we changed our uh, lifestyle for the better. EU is uh, another example. EU is the product of two great wars. I mean, it is heartbreaking still today when you see all those souls uh, lost in battlefields of Europe. We all feel sad. But if you look at the overall outcome for humanity, it gave birth to the EU. So something good came out of it. Because until that moment uh, in Europe, we have lots of small nations. Unlike the US, there are individually identified nations. You got the French, the Germans, and the Dutch, and they got their uh, national identities. And uh, they were in constant uh, haggling and struggles throughout history. This big evil, especially the Second War, they said, look, hang on. Shall we sit down and try to find a way out of this? Because in Europe, there's been wars called Hundred Years Wars. I mean, not several hundreds, but it took more than a hundred years. So long wars and suffering. And eventually, we have decided to be more civil and decided to sit down and implement Plan B. We said, right, instead of fighting, should we just uh, cooperate and have permanent peace, remove borders so that people can move in and out, interact with each other? That way, they might be friends. And it turned out to be true. So in, in uh, Europe, we have 27 nations. They are working in peace. They are moving uh, through their borders. That's except Britain because we decided to exit. So we think we are too great. Uh, but it was uh, just 49 to 51. So even in Britain, still a lot of people, uh, they are in favor of you know, being united. Instead of having wars and disputes, uh, they prefer having peace and collaboration. So my point is this, evil might be evil in itself, but in terms of the outcomes, it might bring and it should bring goodness. So this is one of the theological approach of Nursi, because in my slide, I'm going to give you a Nursi approach to problem of evil. I mean, he doesn't sit down and say, right, here is the problem of evil and here is the answer. See, he sort of spreads uh, this theodicy throughout his writing. So I have identified some 10, 11 uh, answers to problem of evil. So I'm going to quickly share them one by one. It is, uh, the good thing is, uh, some of them are applicable if you are uh, a person of belief, regardless of your uh, religion of choice. Uh, it, it applies. So if you have this faith in a divine, so the answer, the definition uh, fits perfectly. And certain answers, like the ones I just mentioned, if you are a secular person, uh, which you might be, uh, certain answers uh, fit perfectly with uh, secular view. So the overall package gives something to everybody, regardless of their uh, theological position. I try to give reference uh, to the uh, excerpts from Risale Nur. If you are interested, you can uh, I can share the slide uh, with uh, Chestnut, and you can always see where I took the uh, text. So, we have the problem of evil. <clears throat> the first approach to evil is to looking at the big picture. Yes, we are stuck in the house. We have to work from home. Yes, we are really worried because we have a lot of 
loved ones in uh, old age or some of them have underlying medical conditions. And as a matter of fact, we have lost some of our loved ones. I mean, personally, I can count a few from my very close family. We are sorry, we are anxious, we are worried, but we should look at the bigger, uh, bigger, uh, bigger picture. So uh, in the letters, Nursi says, a lesser evil is acceptable for a greater good. But for this, we have to have a secular approach, not necessarily secular, but more uh, ambitious approach, and uh, try to prevent it and try to find a cure to it. Yes, we say prayers. Yes, we know, you know, God is in charge. He sends the <clears throat> problem and he removes the problem. But certain divine outcomes are dependent on human efforts. What do I mean by this? For example, scientific inventions. Scientific inventions, most of the time, comes as a surprise comes as a bonus, not to me, to the person who have been working on it. Great inventions, when you, when you think about them, eureka moments, because it was inspired into the minds of that scientist, simply because he made an effort. You cannot sit home, do nothing, watch Netflix and expect uh, something great coming out of an evil. You should support and you should do something about it, something uh, about uh, the actions to find the cure, prevent this. There is something you can do. So unless you do your part, you cannot expect a great outcome. So one reason why evil comes is to create a better outcome. I don't know exactly what outcome we are going to get out of this COVID. Uh, one thing we have started doing in Britain, we got this social distancing, and we are extremely careful with hygiene and hand washing and sanitation in general. These are all good things. So probably we are going to find better cure and we are going to redesign our lifestyle. Another benefit is, for example, people like me, instead of commuting to the university or the office every day, spending two hours on the train, now uh, we work from home. And it is like having another five years added to your life. Imagine you spend two hours commuting and two hours coming back and recovering. And the beneficial time you use is only four hours. Now, the moment you wake up, have your morning coffee and you're good to go because you don't waste that before and after routines. It is an addition to your life. So depending on uh, where you stand on this, I think it's, it's a positive outcome. And in Britain, we are now talking about implementing this flexible home working permanently because we have realized we don't need that skyscraper in town and pay millions of pounds in rent and service charges. We can just give a bit of extra to our employees and they can work from home. They are happier most of the time. So you, you see, depending on which angle you're looking at. So there are positive outcomes, but you have to think about and you have to work on them. Going back to uh, Nursi, he says, a lesser evil is acceptable for a greater good and you should work for that greater good. If an evil which will lead to a greater good is abundant so that a lesser evil should not occur, a greater evil will have been perpetrated. So you always think, oh, God is great. He should give us tiki de life, dandy life. Then you, you are missing the point. It is in human nature to struggle for progress, struggle for the betterment. And these little uh, problems in life act like a catalyst. As in the example of uh, Great Plague in London, it triggered lots of scientific and medical innovations. So in a way, the problem of evil is a deliberate uh, catalyst for humanity's 
progress, provided they don't sit down and moan and do nothing about it. If they do something about it, it is, it is, uh, it has a potential for a greater good. So, in short, we should look at the big picture, and we should look at the overall result. This is another uh, very, very theological uh, justification uh, of Nursi. He says, uh, everybody is uh, being created equal, but depending on their performance, they earn degrees in life. You know, some people, they go high up because they are very charitable, they are nice, they are helping uh, each other, and they, they earn degrees. In terms of spirituality, we believe what we get is not this life alone. So this is just part of it, because we believe our existence will continue uh, beyond grave. So there is, there is afterlife. So what is that afterlife de decided on? So what is the reference? Well, it is how you have done in this life. Because not everything you do in this life will return instant rewards. I mean, you look at great people, they have done really well throughout their lives, but they live, you know, really miserably. Their standards were really low. And if you think about God, who is a fair God, who is just, how, why does he let this happen? So the theological justification is this, your existence does not end when you die, because it continues beyond grave. So when there is visible injustice in, in this life, this is also a good evidence for afterlife, because God is a fair God, there is perfect balance in the universe, uh, except in our lives, sometimes, uh, things we do for good will not return any uh, reward, and sometimes evil people just get away with it. So to us, it is an evidence that the movie doesn't end here. It has episode two, that is the afterlife. So your rewards and retribution in the afterlife depends on how you do in this life. So for this, you need to be tested. So if everybody is living same standard life, no headache, no problems, nothing, then how would you differentiate the levels? So you need element of test. That's exactly what we do in schools. I teach physics, for example. Students hate it, but I have to give an exam. I have to give them a test. So I know who is high, who is low, otherwise, I would be an unfair teacher. Imagine, imagine I teach a semester, I said, right guys, I hope you enjoyed the semester, goodbye, I'll see you next semester. But everybody's equal and it is not fair. <laughs> In some cases, equality is not necessarily fairness. So you have to give a test to see who is doing what so that you can reward uh, accordingly, especially in a school context. And sometimes you say, look, you have done badly. You need to repeat the semester. You need to retake this course. So testing is an essential element of fairness. God is fair. God is just. That's why he's testing to fulfill his fairness. So here is an extract from uh, the letters. That's one of Nursi's uh, books. He says... Uh, Satan's devils have not been set to pester the angels, and the angels cannot progress. Their degrees are fixed and deficient. However, human beings are different. In the world of humanity, the degrees of progress and decline are infinite. There is an extremely long distance through which to progress from the Nimrods and Pharaohs as far as the voracious saints and the prophets. When you look at humanity, you have figures like Pol Pot, <laughs> Stalin, Saddam, and you got people like Mother Teresa, Gandhi, and some, some other great figures. You see the degrees are infinite. And 
how do you reveal this degree? It is the test. So test is essential for fairness. Another theological uh, approach to suffering is that God created this universe, gave you this life. So in a, in a way, he owns you. So he is the sole owner of everything. Another uh, beautiful uh, extract. This is how you should uh, see evil when it uh, strikes you. Nurse says, <clears throat> so this is the relationship between you and God. He says, a skill, skillful crafts, craftsman makes you a model in return for a beige and dresses you in a bejeweled garment that he has artistically fashioned. Then, in order to display his art and skill, he sometimes shortens it and lengthens it, measures it and trims it. And he makes you sit down and stand up. Because he is an acting artist and you're just a model and you've been paid up front. So if you're modeling for a designer, say Armani, obviously he's gonna ask you to lift your arms, turn around, sit down. He's gonna cut bits of your shirt and, you know, uh, create different, uh, different designs. So can you really complain that he's giving you a grief? Well, you, you, you paid for that already. So our existence is the upfront payment. So we've been paid already. And our employer, in a way, he can do whatever he wants to do on us. So can you say to him, you have made the garment that makes me beautiful ugly. You have caused me trouble making me sit down and stand up. Of course you cannot say that. If you did, you would be crazy because you've been paid. Uh, for the job you, you meant to do. So God is the sole owner, so he can uh, freely practice whatever he wishes. So this is uh, just an extension <clears throat> of uh, argument number three. Uh, we have no right to complain. So we should look at our lives from this perspective. So a person, Nursi says, takes a wretched man to the top of a minaret, a tava. On every step, he gives him a different gift. So, so the, the person is God and wretched man is us. And every step is every stage of our lives. So on every step, he gives him a different gift, a different bounty. Right at the top, he gives him the largest present. Although he wants, he expects thanks and gratitude in return for all those various gifts, the peevish man forgets the presents he has received on, each, on the stairs or considers them to be of no importance and offering no thanks, looks above him and starts to complain because he looks and he sees some other people have higher towers, higher minarets, no minarets, but you can think of as a tower. So imagine you've been given the 20th floor and you receive so many gifts. And when you reach, you look, ah, oh, someone else got 50. And you start moaning and complaining and crying. So this is uh, disrespect and uh, you know lack of gratitude. So your job should be to offer your thanks because you have been given all those bounties saying, if only the minaret had been higher, I could have climbed even further. Why isn't it as tall as that mountain over there or that other minaret? That great ingratitude, it would be, what a great ingratitude it would be if he begins to complain like this, what's wrong? So we, we should be all thankful to what we are given. I'll give you one uh, example from my uh, context in Britain. If you live <clears throat> in a certain context without interacting with other uh, places, 
you easily forget about the bounties you live in. For example, you know, Britain is sort of on, you know, top 10 countries in terms of, uh, you know, living quality index. But people easily forget about this. And instead of looking down and seeing worse of people and being grateful, it'd be like complaining because we look up and we complain about what we are missing. In terms of aiming high and increasing standards and in terms of uh, progress, yes, you should look up and aim higher. But in terms of uh, your spiritual position, you should be grateful to the position you're in. This doesn't mean just give up and no, be thankful with what you are given and don't bother. No, this is not like that. You should make an attempt to progress, to go further, to better your standards. That's your motivation. But your position is always be grateful. Okay? I mean, you have this, you drive, let's say, a Toyota and that person drives a Tesla. Well, you work for uh, getting one of those fancy new models. But at the same time, deep down, you should be grateful to what you are given. <clears throat> so aiming higher, at the same time, being grateful. Because it could have been worse than this. So always be thankful to what you are given. In another uh, theological uh, approach Nursi gives is when you suffer uh, it acts like expiation of sins in a very simple term for every good deed you do in life you have one bucket and you get one good deed in it and every bad action you commit in this life you have another bucket and you got a record of it there so when they balance it out when you die, if you have done more good deeds, you're going to get reward. If you have done uh, more bad deeds, uh, you're going to get retribution. So any suffering in this life removes one of your sins. So it is a great spiritual, uh, religious consolation. I don't know if you are interacting with people who are suffering uh, COVID-19 or anyone who have a relative suffering from COVID-19 and they need a bit of consolation. This is a good one uh, to offer because no suffering goes unaccounted for in this life. Every suffering you persevere removes one of your sins. So this is very uh, theological answer to problem of evil and it is a good consolation to people uh, who, who are suffering so your position should be show perseverance be grateful because there is reward at the end of it <clears throat> again uh, this is essential you need to differentiate levels of people like in my class i got 20 students i have to give them a test to rank them because that is the whole purpose of uh, life as a matter of fact in in the quran there is a uh, verse uh, it reads uh, god created death and life to test you so he created life he created death and anything in between so everything happening in between these two major events is a test which of you is best indeed? So he wants to see. It is like me as a teacher giving my students an exam to see who is doing well and who is not doing so well. So the same principle applies based on this uh, Quranic verse. So he wants to see which of you is best indeed. <clears throat> Uh, this one is a combination of uh, theological and uh, rather secular uh, points of view. When evil comes, 
it is actually warning. I think something is not going right, and scientifically so, theologically so. You look at a person, if he is putting on too much weight, or if he is getting very sleepy and tired after a big meal, you think, hmm, there must be something wrong because it is not behaving in a normal fashion. So it, it, is, it is actually a warning sign. So we should, we should look at all these big uh, pandemics uh, from this perspective, something we are doing is not right. I'll take you, we still don't know 100% in the context of COVID-19 what exactly we are doing wrong, but I'll take you back to the plague. Uh, we know we were doing things uh, wrong. We had open sewage, you know, running through cities and we were really poor in uh, hygiene, personal hygiene, food hygiene. So these were the things we were doing wrong. Then evil comes and it is to correct uh, our incorrect behavior, albeit spiritual or secular behavior. So if there is evil coming to you, you should look at from both per perspective as an individual what have i done wrong why am i facing this uh, calamity from secular perspective what have i done wrong that this is happening did i miss something so as good believers we should take both approaches together and we should look from theological perspective and secular perspective, because for every evil, there are theological implications and secular implications. So in the example of uh, the plague, it was the hygiene. And in the example of uh, COVID, I don't know, maybe we were not supposed to eat some random animals because the theory goes, you know, WHO is in uh, Wuhan now, they are trying to find out uh, why this, virus suddenly emerge and spread all over the place. It is mysterious, but some say uh, because people eat some weird animals that are not meant to be eaten, like bats and pangolins and some, some weird animals. It could be a warning, it could be a signal that uh, there is something we are doing wrong. So this uh, last slide, in the last few minutes, I would like to talk about this. <clears throat> in terms of uh, uh, human comfort, if you look at the Northern Hemisphere, uh, it is uh, less friendly, let's say. In terms of uh, life comfort, the, the center belt areas near equator is quite warm, plenty of plantations, easy for uh, growing crops, nursing animals, agriculture. Overall, it is quite nice. But if you look at the map, uh, this is the uh, world wealth levels in 2011. It is more or less the same. There is a pattern emerging. If you look at the Northern Hemisphere, theoretically, those are hit by evil more than the central belt. For example, you look at Norway, well, it's under snow most of the year. It, it is evil, but it is a catalyst for progress. So you have to invent railways, you have to invent good housing, you have to lay pipelines, you have to insulate your homes, you have to come up with new technologies and new innovations to survive. That's why there's been greater progress in the Northern Hemisphere than the Central Belt. Because if you are living in a, under a beautiful palm tree, river is running by, goats are grazing, chickens are laying eggs, you just think, this is fantastic. Life is dandy. Why should I bother innovating 
or, you know, working for progress. Basically, you could have survived in those comfortable uh, lands exactly how you were surviving 5,000 years ago. Same, same farming, same agriculture, same housing, because it's comfortable. Whereas in the north, where there is shortage, where there is more evil, let's say, in inverted commas, you come up with innovation and it is good for progress. Japan is a great example. Holland is fantastic. It is the second largest exporter of agricultural products in the world after the US. And Holland, the Netherlands, is most of it is below sea levels. So basically, you have to put a wall to stop sea. Then below sea level, you have land to cultivate. And the Dutch have been really good at it. So so-called evil help those uh, nations to progress. Well, I'm hoping this uh, COVID, yes, it has been very painful. Yes, we have uh, lost our loved ones and we are still very anxious. But I think overall, if you do the right things, if we work towards the betterment of humanity, I think and I feel it's going to uh, bring about goodness for humanity. I don't know exactly. Uh, one thing I can just give an example. Uh, only on BBC recently I heard the uh, government in Britain, they said, as soon as uh, we inoculate our most vulnerable, we are going to help everybody else. Because the slogan is this, if, if uh, uh, provided everybody, unless everybody is safe, this is the slogan, now I'm just, unless everybody is safe, nobody is safe. So you see, this, this pandemic brought us to this position. I cannot say, right, I, I got AstraZeneca uh, job and I'm going to vaccinate everybody. But I do business with India. I got tourists coming from uh, Africa. I interact with South America. You see, unless everybody is safe, nobody is safe. It is already bringing new arguments and new approaches to how to manage our affairs globally. Well, I'm hoping, uh, you know, as a result of all this suffering, something positive will come out of this uh, pandemic. I think my time is up here. I will end my presentation and I will just uh, look at the chat room if there is anything in there. Oh, Thank there's a question. Yes, there's there's a couple questions that maybe we can take. Um, I can ask them if, if you like. Yeah, if you can ask it, uh, people <laughs> right. hear someone different, go ahead. Okay, so the question is, in the era when science and religion is deemed contradictory, what led you to move from physics to theology? Well, I, I disagree. Science and religion uh, do not contradict. Uh, one of my previous lessons earlier today, the theme was theory of evolution. I think uh, so-called science and religion's contradiction is made up. Because uh, after enlightenment in Europe, uh, people thought we should separate religion and life and implement secularism to move forward, which was effective in a way. Then we came to a position to say, oh, they, they contradict. Well, we disagree. I mean, if you are a good believer, if you believe in God, you should understand him and you should see how he works. So you need to understand science. So science is an essential element to become a good believer. Otherwise, you're just gonna, you know, put uh, horse visors and just look at religion and turn your back to science. This is the very essence of Nursi's teachings. And he committed his life to bring them together. He says, you need to be a good scientist. You need to understand science to understand God, understand religion. But uh, again, uh, this is sort of imposed upon us. They said, I had this conflict when I was uh, a young student. 
I was very scientific. I was really interested, and I was also interested in religion and uh, you know prayers and God, etc. And people were saying, "How come you're really good in physics and you're?" Well, I don't see any contradiction. It just helps me to become a more comprehensive person. I think uh, as good global citizens, instead of promoting this separation, I think we should argue for unification of these two elements. Yeah, everybody should learn science. Everybody should understand how the universe, how the world works. And uh, yeah, then they think about who is behind all this? Why are these happenings happening? So you need to bring them together. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm, I'm a good uh, believing scientist, and I like to stay like that. And I promote this view. To me, there is no contradiction. I think being a good scientist makes me a good believer. All right, thank you. Um, we have another question. If anyone wants to say their question in person, you're also more than welcome. Um, this, the other question is, do you think in the end, the problem of evil is solvable or destined to remain as a mystery or part of Gaib, the unseen? No, I think problem of evil is an essential tool for God uh, for certain results, testing human beings, betterment of humanity, expiation of sins. You cannot think of a life whereby there is no evil, because we had that. Before the creation of humanity, there were angels. So this is a bit Quranic. Uh, we understand from the Quran, before human beings were created, God had angels. They were worshiping God. They were not tested, and they had all same spiritual levels. Then God wished to create human beings so that they can be tested, so that he can see the differentiations in level. So for as long as humanity exists, uh, evil should exist because it, it is an essential uh, essential element. I mean, imagine you have all those motorways, but you have no cars. So they, they complement each other. They are essential for each other. And uh, we shouldn't see evil as something negative. You should uh, look at the overall uh, result and uh, take the message, what is what is that problem telling us? So uh, to, to me, it's not a mystery. It is the work, work of God, and uh, he's using that tool uh, to achieve certain results. So no mystery there. All right. Um, we have another question. The oppressed people feel sorry that the cruelty of the oppressors have gone unpunished in this world. Some bad people even live a comfortable life. What can be recommended to these people in such situations to relieve them? I think uh, because I, I studied atheism and theism, the existence of God, and some people says, uh, how, do we, how do we prove there is God? I said, suffering. They say, because they expect, look at this beautiful life and all these beautiful fruits and lovely animals. I said, no, suffering is the evidence of the existence of God. They say, what do you mean? The universe is in a perfect balance. We understand a powerful maker is in charge, controlling everything, except when it comes to suffering of uh, human beings. Pol Pot is a good example. He murdered so many people, he had a comfortable retirement, and he just passed away, he died, nothing happened. To me, this is the evidence of afterlife. Because you cannot observe a perfect universe, a fair God, looking after everything that he created, and letting evil go in unpunished. It is the evidence that he's gonna, he's gonna fulfill this justice, if not here, in a place we don't see yet. I give speeding ticket example, because I interact with uh, lots of friends in Britain and most of them are very secular. I say, you're driving down on the motorway, it's a speed limit 70. And you see this guy just speeding past at 100 miles an hour. And you say, oh, life is so on fire. Look, I'm sticking to speed limit and this guy, because you think, he reached his destination and nothing happened because you don't see. But what happens that you don't see is this. 
there are cameras along the motorway. They record who's doing what, and they send the ticket by post to that person. He is getting the punishment, but you don't see it. So this doesn't mean, oh, I should speed too, because there is no uh, punishment or reward for my action. We both drive from Leeds to London. I'm sticking to rules and regulations, and he's not, and he's getting away with it. No, he's not. He's going to get the ticket, but you don't see. Life is a bit like that. You do your best. You are being a good person. That person gets away with his evil. He doesn't. He gets uh, his punishment <laughs> through the post the next day. You don't see, but he sees it. So this is afterlife. Because Feigat, who is showing all his fairness in this universe, everything is in perfect balance, letting certain evil individuals getting away with it. No, he's not. He's going to send the ticket by post the next day. And everybody will get, uh, it is another Quranic expression, whatever atom size good you do, you're going to get reward for it. And whatever atom size evil you commit, you're going to get punishment for it. Whatever atom size goodness you do, you see. So it's going to happen uh, in a later stage. So it is, God is fair, God is, God is just, and certain thing, things he does uh, happens in a place you don't see. Some of them happen here. Someone is being evil to you, and you think he's living a you know, dandy life, but he has got lots of other problems that you don't see. So certain manifestation of divine name just, Al-Adl manifests itself in this life that you don't see. And certain aspects of the just, Al-Adl, manifest itself in the afterlife. So you can tell people who are suffering in this life that there is going to be reward to their perseverance. And they shouldn't feel upset when people get away, get away uh, with their evil. No, they don't get away with their evil. There is justice regardless, definitely. So, um, maybe we can take one more question. Um, I have a question that was sent to me privately, so I'll read that. Uh, is there a way to explain this problem in theodicy to the kids? Because kids ask about the existence of evil. Oh, we should tell them. Uh, God is sending this as a test. And when something bad happens to us, uh, we should persevere and we should find ways out of it. God is doing this deliberately for our benefit, for our goodness. And we should give an example of inoculation. You know, we got MMR vaccine. Uh, why are we giving that job to our kids when they are in primary school? So that they can develop immunity to those uh, illnesses. Essentially, you are giving small scale uh, bacteria and virus through their system so they can become stronger and better uh, protected for their uh, future life evil is like that so god wants us to be better individuals stronger individuals and continuous to progress that's why he gives us these problems so he wants us to fight to think to work for the betterment of ourselves to become better people and uh, if we are thankful and show perseverance and patience, he rewards us. It worked quite well with children. So that's uh, that's what I do to my children. It works most of the time. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Gook, for sharing your knowledge with us. It was wonderful thank having you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for everyone that joined us today. Uh, for anyone that missed the presentation, we'll have the highlights video up on YouTube soon. Um, so follow our YouTube channel to not miss that. Our next seminar uh, will be in March. Uh, so please follow us on all our social media um, to be updated on future events. And all our social media and contact info will be in the chat box below. So you can um, note that there. 
Uh, I also would like to remind you guys, and for those that don't know about it, um, our Inspirarity Dialogue meetings. Uh, we had our first one last month. Uh, every second Sunday of each month, uh, people of different backgrounds, we get together to talk about a topic. And this month, um, well, in February, on February 14th, we will be uh, having our second meeting. We're going to be talking about prayer. So if anyone wants to you know, get more information on that, make sure you email us or reach out to us and we will um, guide you to how to join. Um, once again, thank you all for joining. I don't know how the weather is in uh, where you are, Dr. Guk, but here we have a winter storm. Um, so I hope everyone stays warm and safe and make sure to stay inside and don't travel. All right, thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, bye-bye.